Across the land and in our deep seas, an army of people is working flat out to meet our energy demands. We are fundamentally splitting the atom. This is the story of those at the sharp end of the power industry. Energy production is changing. In this series, we find out how it works. When you are trying to achieve two thousandths of an inch on something that weighs 80 or 90 tonnes, that's what sorts the men from the boys. From nuclear energy and offshore gas to biomass and harnessing the wind. It's energy production on an epic scale. At one point, there'll be over 10,000 people working on this project. In this episode, I travel offshore to meet the men and women extracting gas from under the sea. This is how our power is made. I'm Keely Donovan, and like many people, I know little about the process that gets gas to my home. To find out more, I'm joining the transfer of workers to the Morecambe Bay gas field. I need my passport for the 12-minute helicopter flight, and my bags and me are weighed. Offshore workers undergo rigorous safety training. I've done mine at a facility in Aberdeen that involved escaping from a ditched helicopter. I've passed all the tests, now I just need to get this survival suit on. The sea temperature at this time of year is about 13 degrees, so pretty chilly. But this suit is designed to keep me alive for longer should I end up in the water. But hopefully it won't come to that. I'm visiting a gas platform run by Spirit Energy a UK oil and gas company that also has assets in Dutch, Danish and Norwegian waters. The Morecambe Bay gas field is just 16 miles off the Lancashire coast. It's an unusual commute, but soon my destination looms into view. This is Spirit Energy's central production platform and the hub for its Morecambe Bay operation. The complex is huge. The sea is around 100 feet deep here and the platform has a combined weight of more than 58,000 tonnes. It's split into three distinct parts, which are connected by walkways. The drilling platform is where the gas is extracted from the seabed. The middle platform is where the gas is processed before being sent back to shore. And the third structure is where the staff live. They work two weeks on, three weeks off. So this is their home where they eat, sleep and spend their downtime. And on first impressions, it's a bit of a maze. Right, second North Markham, sort yourselves out. But thankfully, Steph Sunley is going to give me a guided tour. So, we're dropping down onto floor four. Yep, this is where you've got your recreational rooms here. You've got your offices, OIM and all your other managers through here, and your control room. Should we head this way? Oh, this is hot. It's very heavy. <laughs> Thank you. Steph's worked offshore for almost a decade. She was a stewardess, but now coordinates helicopter transfers. With 12-hour shifts, relaxation is at a premium. So this is uh, one of two gyms we have on board the platform. This is our fitness gym. As you can see, it's not that busy, but of an evening, it gets really busy in here. Um, we get fed too much on here, and if you don't actually make an effort to come to the gym, you just you put on loads of weight. So. How do you have time, though? Because you work such long shifts on here. You have to make time. And I think not only that, it releases endorphins that actually make you feel happy, so I actually make time to come in here. So this is level two, one of the two levels of accommodation that we've got on board. And this here is your cabin. Excellent. 
So as you can see, we've got a recreation room here where you can sit and watch the TV or you can read a book. Put your feet up. Yeah, and you've also got storage cupboards here for any of your belongings. So. You've got one bathroom that's shared between the two cabins here. We've got bunk beds, old school. So um, two people have to share this then? Yeah, that is a challenge, but most of the time we've got days and nights, so you've actually got someone sleeping while someone's working and vice versa. In fact, actually saying that, we should probably keep our voices down because we do have night shift around yes. us. This, where we're going, is the most important room on the platform. This is the galley. Smell it. <laughs> this is where we eat. You've got your hot food for three meals a day, but you've also got your um, cheese and biscuits, your puddings, and round the other side, we have the salad bar. And it's a perk of the job that the meals are free. The guys are quite lucky. They go out and park, they work all day, they burn it off. But for me, I um, sit at a desk for long shifts and that's why I have to go to the gym because as you can see it's very tempting. Morecambe was once Britain's biggest gas field, producing a fifth of the country's needs. Now that figure is down to around 4%. The stats for this place are impressive. The Morecambe Bay gas reservoir below my feet is the same size as the city of Birmingham. And each day, 6.7 million cubic metres of gas is produced here. That's enough to fill Wembley Stadium six times. Getting to the remaining gas remains complex, and that's where engineers like Andy Pulford come in. So this is a wellhead. Uh, it's commonly known as a Christmas tree, just because it sort of resembles a Christmas tree. Does it? <laughs> uh, it's a selection of valves and it's where the point of gas comes from the reservoir into the platform. So we use the valves and the tree to control that um, flow, to isolate the flow if we need to and to um, carry out works on the well and gas stream. So uh, the tree comes up and uh, the gas flows through that and through a flow line and off into the process into the system. How they get the gas out is unusual. In most other places, wells are drilled vertically. But because the gas field is big but relatively shallow, most of the drills went in at a 30 degree angle. It's a process that's called slant drilling. The gas is trapped in a sandstone layer around 3,000 feet below the seabed. The angled drilling has enabled more of it to be accessed. So most people would commonly think of a gas reservoir maybe as a big cave filled with gas as you'd expect, but actually it's porous rock and it's liquids that are entrained in that porous rock. So we send that to onshore to be further refined and then the gas is dehydrated, dried and would be sent into the national grid more as a gas as you'd expect. So back in the day when you first discovered the reservoir there was loads of gas and that helped force it up then? Yes, as those pressures decay and the reservoirs uh, age and the pressures drop off, we have to use compression and that acts as a, as a draw and we, and we use that as suction pressure to draw the gas out. So they're like giant straws almost. They are exactly like giant straws, straight into a gas reservoir. In some places, this platform feels alive. If I put my ear to this pipe here, I can hear the gas rushing through it, making its way from below the seabed to our homes. Britain's natural gas boom began in the 1960s, when it was discovered under the North Sea. And help to get to it came from an unlikely source. Most of the crew are Texans, the ship being owned by a Texan company, hence the snappy Western type headgear. These men are specialists with the know-how in getting oil and gas from under the seabed. Highly paid, they work long hours day after day in the race to bring the new gas into British homes. It was an energy revolution, and soon huge pipelines were emerging from the sea. New gas terminals were built across the country to process this abundant resource. And by the mid-70s, gas was found under Morecambe Bay, but it'd be another decade before production started. Platform life has a steady routine. By 7am, most jobs are underway. Tom Owen Wilding's gas career began as an apprentice. He's now a mechanical technician, and as well as fixing broken pumps, he's a coxswain of one of the lifeboats. 
carrying out the routine coxswain checks, which is something we do every two weeks to ensure the lifeboat is fit for use in case we ever have to use it in an emergency. So they need to be ready to go at ready, any given time? Ready to go. Have you ever taken one out? I haven't, no, only on my training. So hopefully I don't have to. You're a long way from home out here, but people are tempted by a well-paid job that involves less than six months' work a year. It's definitely not suited to everyone. You've got to be able to work away from home for two weeks, miss special events like birthdays and Christmas, but what you've got to think about is when you get off the rig, you've got three weeks at home to do whatever you want. I don't think I could go back to a nine-to-five job on, on shore now because the weekends off wouldn't be long enough. <laughs> You like a long stretch of I like, time. I like the three weeks off. Come on then, can we, can we yeah, get in this? Yeah, let's go for it. Thank you. Oh, it's bigger than I thought. There seems to be lots of seat belts. How many people would fit in here? Yeah, so it's designed to take 65 people, which, you, as you can imagine, it's a, it'd be a squeeze. Yeah. And... I wouldn't want to be in here. No, neither would I. <laughs> so as a coxswain, that's where I'll be sat. One of the first things we have to do is a radio check with the control room to check that it's functioning correctly. Okay. What you need to do to speak is hold that button down uh -huh. and say Alpha Control, this is Lifeboat 4, radio check, over. Alpha Control, this is Lifeboat 4, radio check. Radio check, Lifeboat 4. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Next thing we'll do is an engine start, make sure it's running okay. It's not going to go anywhere. No, it's not going to go anywhere. to be launching this for real but if you did this would be the seat to be in the best seat in the house isn't it definitely there are obvious dangers with gas so there are regular emergency drills to keep staff on their toes everything is tested including the sprinkler system on the drilling platform And even though it's a Saturday night, there's a safety exercise. At least one is held every week. Attention, attention all personnel. For exercise, for exercise, we have an indication of smoke and fire in the D3 cellar electrical stores. It's 7 o'clock at night and the general platform alarm has gone off, so everyone on board is going to head to their muster points. This exercise is to find a potential casualty following a fire. Back up team, back up fire team, alpha control, radio check over. In the control room, platform boss Andy Braithwaite is leading the operation. OK, that's time out, everybody. Eyes on me, please. So the situation is then we've got a confirmed fire in D3 Electrical Store. Um, at the moment, the potential for escalation is high for people. We haven't got the numbers for mustering yet. And the potential for the installation um, in terms of escalation factor is high until we've got uh, people on scene dealing with the situation. Everyone has a role to play and health and safety advisor Paul Barron is helping me make sense of it all. Well, what's actually happening is the platform fire and gas system is very, very comprehensive, so it'll detect any fire or a gas release and it'll do the firefighting itself. It'll normally set up a deluge. So we're not in any rush to commit our people and put them in any sort of danger until we know it's safe to do so. Back in the control room, the flow of information keeps coming. We're going to get a team of four under BA. We're going to roll out a fire hose so we can do door entry checks. And we're going to go in there to do a search and rescue of the module to see it's all clear or not over. The purpose of the exercise is to make sure that we're all ready to respond to any kind of event immediately, coordinating the teams, making sure we, we look after ourselves on this, uh, on this island. So the fire team are heading for this brown door here. That's where we think the casualty is. Staff volunteer to be firefighters. This might have been a drill, but they've gained vital experience for an event they hope will never happen. It's gone pretty well. We uh, got to location fairly quickly, um, deployed the fire team, um, they located the casualty, um, we dealt with the fire, um, everybody got to muster quickly. Um, so all in all, uh, our system's worked and gives us all confidence on the platform that uh, should we need to deal with a real event, that we're there and we'll be ready. Finding and getting the
the gas out of Morecambe Bay is just one part of the story. What comes next is turning it into the stuff that we use in our homes and businesses. And that happens here in Barrow on the Cumbrian coast. Spirit Energy's gas terminal is vast. On a site the size of 27 football pitches, around 200 people work round the clock to process gas from different parts of the Morecambe field. There's 53 miles of pipework and enough gas flowing through them to fuel around a million and a half homes. The site's so big, bikes are the preferred way of getting around. Strict safety rules have to be followed. Some of the gas coming into Barrow contains highly toxic hydrogen sulphide. With pipes in every direction, it's hard to know what's going on, so engineer Nathan Jones is guiding me through it. To the right, we've processed the gas. It's the main gas route out of the terminal. And then to the left, we've processed all the byproducts of the condensate and we recover methanol. So that's all the waste over this side? Yeah, yeah, so we re recover that, process it, sell that on. Safety is obviously a priority here, isn't it? I mean, we've got these, these monitors on here, but it's all over the site that it's really serious, isn't it? Yeah, so these are your personal H2S. So if any of these ever go off, you don your hood, uh, which is to protect your breathing space. So we've not only got this bit of kit on us, we've also got site-wide gas and fire detection, uh, which is fed directly to the control room. If anything was to happen, the control room operator would react to it, or the system, if it was such a bad case, would completely shut the terminal down. The gas has to be chilled and heated to remove impurities and other nasties. So how big are the pipes that, that bring the gas here? Yeah, we've got 36 inch lines that bring the gas from offshore to onshore. Uh, that comes directly into the slug catch we've got, which knocks out the condensate and methanol and water. That then goes onto our compression train. So I'm going to have to say slug catcher? Yeah, so it's called a slug catcher we class the liquid as slugs of liquid. Right. That's the easiest uh, way to put it. There are strong family connections at Barrow. Sons and daughters often follow their parents into work. But amongst the pipes and valves, it's also a place where relationships blossom. Can be changed. That's I'm going this week. Mm -hmm. Martin Haywood is part of a regulatory team making sure engineering work stays within the rules. Martin's worked across the globe, but was drawn back to his native Cumbria. You mentioned that you've worked in some really exciting sounding places all over the world, but you found yourself back at home in Barrow. Yeah, yeah. and it was just an opportunity. Uh, it was great that friends and family are around here, and, uh, and, and I love the area. You know, you've got the Lake, St the Lake District on your doorstep. Why wouldn't you want to come here? I hear your wife works here. My wife does work here, yes. <laughs> Presumably you met at work. I did meet her at work, <laughs> yes. Uh, she came through, she was one of the first engineering graduates that came through. Martin's other half is Tara Abachi. Originally from Iran, she's a senior mechanical engineer leading big projects at Barrow. So what's her memory of how she got together with Martin? He was there as part of the, a more senior role at the time. So yeah, we, we started to sort of see each other a few months after and and then we uh, eventually got married. <laughs> During my wedding speech, I said uh, I was asked to look after her as a graduate and I take my job very seriously. <laughs> uh, so, yes, we, got, <laughs> we then got married. That was uh, 13, 14 years ago. And now you work with him every day, do you? We do, obviously, interact uh, on, a, on a weekly basis, yeah. And do you talk about work at home? We try not to. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, yeah, sometimes it, uh, it kind of sneaks in. There are final checks before the gas reaches our homes and businesses. They're done from the control room. But to get to it, you've got to get past these massive blast doors. Very James Bond. The control room monitors the whole site and the offshore gas field. Yeah, we've got an issue with the um, gas dew point. If you could go and have a look at the heat, I think we've lost a few burners over. And today, Sean Tyson is in the hot seat. We're flowing quarter of a million metres cubed an hour. It's a oh, huge volume of gas. Massive amount. Yes, absolutely, yeah. And that's going out every hour, 24 hours. How many homes is that? Uh, tens of thousands. Right. But hundreds of thousands. The gas quality is constantly checked. 
We don't want toxic gas going out the terminal, so we remove that. Gas has to meet a burnability requirement, so we ensure it does that. And also, it's got to not have a high moisture content because you don't want water in your gas. And I'm guessing it's a 24-7 operation. 24-7, Christmas Day, New Year's Day. Oh. We'll be here. Christmas Day this year, we're here. Because oh, everybody wants gas on Christmas yeah, Day, don't you? Yeah, you want your turkey cooked, don't you? So <laughs> we're there to do it for you. So when you're cooking your turkey, have a thought. I'll think of you, sat here, <laughs> with your Christmas hat on. Yeah. The offshore operation runs every day of the year too. But what happens if you're out here and feeling a bit under the weather? If you've got any ailments or medical needs, then this is the place to come. And what did your blood pressure come back at? I wouldn't imagine you'd be... Medic Norman Todd is a former nurse and fisherman. For nine years, he's been keeping platform staff healthy. But sometimes there are things he just can't deal with. We have maybe some people with uh, cardiac issues we've had to send back on shore. We've had some with appendicitis before, pneumonia. So if someone was on shore and they had to go to hospital, then we would consider exactly the same. So you would only deal with something you could go to the doctor for rather than A&E? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. So what's the most common problem someone would come here with? The cold, also known as the man flu. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it is 90% of the work. Uh, I would say, are, are minor ailments. And in his three weeks between shifts, Norman has an unusual hobby. I mean, love is sea swimming. Go into the, some of the frozen lochs up in the, the highlands, which are at freezing points at zero degrees in, and it can be up to my sort of minus 12 outside, and it's just in a pair of trunks. But I don't spend too long in. Ten, ten minutes at a time is good, but uh, you just get an amazing buzz for the rest of the day after it. It must be very frustrating being on here, being surrounded by water and not being able to get in, though. There are some days in the summertime you look out and the sea's like glass and then you're feeling quite hot and you think, how nice would that be just to get in there for a swim? But, I think uh, that's a big no-no. It's a big, big no-no. <laughs> I have asked, but uh, I have been declined. <laughs> While Norman dreams of open water, most of the staff have their eyes on another prize. One game has gripped the platform. Bingo. OK, eyes down, playing for the line. Your first number this evening. All of fives. Five and five. Fifty-five. Order, order. Bingo brings everyone together. <laughs> it's a great way to unwind. Eight and three, eighty-three. Yep. Oh. <laughs> With no alcohol allowed on board, this is about as wild as a Saturday night gets. On a clear day, you can see the Lake District fells and Blackpool Tower is just 16 miles away. Civilization might be within eye shot, but the only way to get significant supplies is by boat. Twice a week, machinery, spares and diesel arrive, as well as a phenomenal amount of food. Each week, workers consume 200 kilos of potatoes, 4,500 litres of fresh water, 100 loaves and 700 bars of chocolate. But the most frequently moved cargo is human, and that's where Steph Sunley comes in. Right, Kevin, you need to fill in one of these for me. Tick for yes, cross for no, any if it's not applicable, OK? And I'll take your keys and your suit card when you're finished with them as well. Helicopters are like taxis, moving people around the gas field. Dotted around the central platform are a series of unmanned installations. Steph coordinates the traffic. No one goes anywhere unless she says so. When you get over there, call me and I'll book it on, yep. OK? Nine people will go to Millim, and then in 20 minutes, there'll be 22 people going to the North Morecambe. You've just got to plan all the flights and have everyone on the right, right flight, basically. Is this the busiest part of the operation, do you think? Yeah. 
yeah, flying's definitely the busiest. And then you've got to obviously, everyone who comes on and off the platform goes through us. You seem like you love it here. I do, I love it, I wouldn't change it. I think if it was quiet, you just physically feel bored and your trip drags, whereas I've already got four shifts left to go and I feel like I've just got here. There are around 15 daily helicopter flights, moving up to 50 people within the gas field. I notice they're all getting on the scales. Why are you weighing them? Every single time the aircraft lifts, you get up a certain weight, so it might be 700 kilos or 900 kilos, and you've got to make sure you're within that. So if you're not, then you have to bump someone or bump a bag or it uh, becomes difficult. So you're not keeping a note of whether people are gaining weight while they're offshore? So when they check in and they've gone up three kilos, I will tell them. I bet they love you. Exactly, <laughs> but I do tell them if they've lost weight as well, to be fair. With much of the gas now extracted, two remote platforms are being decommissioned and dismantled. And it's just a short helicopter hop to see how it's being done. 22,000 tonnes of infrastructure will be removed from the Irish Sea and a dozen wells plugged with concrete. Donald Martin is leading the team that's making it happen. There's still 180 billion cubic feet of gas in the ground. Um, the work that we're doing on this project helps us to actually rationalise the infrastructure to a smaller size, which is much more suitable to recover the, the remaining gas. So, what happens to all of this then? Well, we're going to recycle as much as possible, so we've set a target of 95% of all of the materials. Everything will go, from the old control rooms to the redundant diesel generators. The scrap metal won't be wasted. It could be used in, in manufacturing of cars, um, you know, it could be used to build um, new offshore facilities. You can see the, the wind farms that we have in the background. It would be quite nice to think that the wind industry could, could use some of the infrastructure in the future. When Morecambe's gas came on stream in 1985, they thought it would last around 35 years. But Spirit Energy's boss, Neil McCulloch, thinks the end is still some way off. We think there's at least a decade of life left in, in Morecambe Bay. We've found new ways to extend the life of the facilities and, and allow us to produce more of the gas that was originally in place. New techniques and new technology means Morecambe Bay will continue to power the UK. But in the midst of a green, renewable energy revolution, just where does gas, a fossil fuel, fit in? We'll see less and less oil and gas in the energy mix and more and more renewables, but that's going to take, you know, three or four decades for that transition to be complete. We've been powering the nation for 35 years and it's something we're all very proud of and that we'd like to continue for another decade or more.